Forward, anybody, any ladies, or anybody that might need to have a seat, please. Yeah. If anybody needs. Come in close, folks. It's, it's all right. Gather around the family. And we're going to begin our service with military honors. We, the members of VFW Post 7536, Veterans of Foreign Wars of the United States, are here assembled to pay a lasting tribute of respect to our departed comrade. When the call of our country was heard, Comrade Shipman answered, South was forgotten in the cause of the greater good. Bravely, they marched away with the abiding faith in their God, their country, and their flag. The red of our country's flag was made redder by their heroism, the white more stainlessly pure by the modes which impelled them. And in the starry field of our, our nation's glorious banner, the blue has been glorified by the service they have given for American ideals. The chapel will invoke divine blessings. Oh God, Father of us all, we will here extend uh, these final earthly tributes to our beloved family. Accept our prayers on behalf of our soul. Welcome to Take our hands to rest in peace. Look the mercy upon the little one who reigns by the hands of One by one, as the years roll on, we are called upon to fulfill these sad duties 
our respect to our departed comrades. Said ship. Officers of the BFW 7536, veterans of foreign wars of the United States, will now perform the, du the last duties of your stations. Junior Vice Commander. On the behalf of the VFW 7576, Veteran of Foreign Wars of the United States, I present this evergreen tribute as a symbol of our undying love of our comrade. generation emulate the unselfish devotion to duty even to the last of our comrades. as the last written reflection of their comrades in arms of any casket or departed comrade and the family metal dust from the symbol for the victim. Republic, other veterans are on force, foreign wars, enlisted and served. We place upon this casket this emblem of our country, a country whose arms are always open to shelter the oppressed. Now pledge ourselves to you to provide and support and protection for those left behind. And to pick up the banner and lay down by our comrades and continue continue to march to face the challenges that confront life and may our many, many battles be done in goodwill. And that is all. 
This concludes our service. For uh, those of you that have and, uh, served active duty during the playing of taps, we'll ask that you give hand salute. Otherwise, everyone else, if you place your hand over your heart during the playing of taps.
President of the United States, the United States Army, and a grateful nation. Please accept this flag as a symbol of our appreciation for your loved one's honorable and faithful service. To those of you who gather here, family and friends, and to those who are joining us on Zoom, including, of course, Sydney's sister Harriet, we offer, we offer our condolences to all of you. I'm Rabbi Eddie Sukal from the Shul. We begin our service with words from the 23rd Psalm. We turn to the Psalms in grief with the hope that these ancient poems might provide us with a measure of comfort that we might garner some consolation from them. Adonai roi lohalech sar binotesh yarbiseni amim nunot menukot yinahaleni nafshi yishovem yancheni v'ma'agalei sedek l'ma'an shemo gam ki elech begei tzalma velo irara ki ata imadi shiktecha u'mishantecha Ema yanaha muni ka aroch lefanai shulcha neged tzorerai dishanta dishanta roshi but dishanta v'shem en roshi kosi rivaya ach tov v'chesed yedufuni kol yemei chayai v'shavti v'shavti b'vet Adonai le'orech yami. God is my shepherd, I shall not want. God makes me lie down in green pastures, leads me beside still waters and restores my soul. You lead me in right paths for the sake of your name. Even when I walk in the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You have set a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of God forever. I mentioned 
earlier, it is perfectly okay for children to make noise. And so if he wanders around a little bit, that's okay. It's good for everybody. Back in middle school, or perhaps early in high school, many of us read a book, Death Be Not Proud, written by the journalist and author John Gunther. He wrote it to cope with and really in tribute to his son who died young. I want to read a passage from it. The circumstance today is, of course, very different. Sidney did not die young. No one could say that. <laughs> he did not rush. 98 years, well lived and fully lived and richly lived. And over the years, I got to know Sydney a bit. And so I can only say and live on his terms. <laughs> but this excerpt from a very different circumstance is still apt. The influence, the impact of a person continues to exert itself long after mortal bonds have broken. Not only that he lives in our hearts or in anything he truly touched, but that a person transmits permanently something of what he was to all of us. The fabric of the universe is continuous and eternal. Our Jewish tradition teaches us to understand death as part of a divine pattern of the universe. We could not have our sensitivity without our fragility. Mortality is the price we pay for the privilege of love, of thought, of creative work. It is the toll on the bridge of being from which clods of earth and snow peak mountain summits are exempt. Because we are human, we are prisoners of the years, and yet that very prison is the room of discipline in which we, driven by the urgency of time, create and live. When we die, those who have been touched and illumined by the flame of our being should rejoice and think of us with joyous remembrance. Rita and Naomi and David and your spouses and family, the grandchildren, the great-grandchildren. If I counted right, there are nine grandchildren. That's a baseball team, so that's a good thing. And five great-grandchildren. <laughs> what a blessing. If Sydney were only granted a long life, that would have been enough. Dayenu, if he were just granted wonderful children, that would have been enough. If it had only been wonderful grandchildren, that would have been enough. Great grandchildren. They say that children are our investment in our future, and grandchildren, the interest on that investment, great-grandchildren, some kind of wild compound interest. <laughs> and from that perspective, Sidney was a very wealthy and rich man. And what's best about that is that he knew it, and he appreciated that. And he took such delight and such joy to share reflections on his father. I'd like to call upon David. All of you know that that would have been one lousy baseball team. <laughs> <laughs> hey now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I have a tissue in my breast pocket. Your dad never failed to have a tissue in his breast pocket and a pen. So a bunch of the grandchildren also. 
I recently heard a comedian say that a grandparent is a lot like a rescue dog. You don't necessarily know what happened to them before you got them that made them the way they are. Sidney Shipman was a child of the Great Depression. This explains a lifelong inability to toss out any container that mm -hmm. might someday be useful. Never mind the hundreds of rinsed out yogurt containers already accumulating dust in the basement, along with a vast stockpile of food. Dad graduated high school just as Pearl Harbor was bombed. He didn't wait to be drafted. He had served in North Africa for over a year by the time the troops landed in Normandy on D-Day. As the war progressed, he also served in Sicily and in Italy. One of his favorite stories from that time, one of our favorite stories from that time, is the fencing story, which uh, I'm not going to share now, but uh, I recently reposted on my Facebook page with Dad telling the story when uh, we were on, on our flight together, so I'd encourage you to give him a listen for that. Um, whenever Dad mentioned that war, which he didn't really do a whole lot, the one point that he always made was how easy his service was compared to his own father who had fought in the trenches in World War I. Recognizing Dad's service had the pleasure of escorting him on honor flight in early 2017. While he was still fully mobile and able to do all the walking, it was a bucket list level trip, much like the mom's losing her mind tour again a few years earlier. <laughs> he resisted going, especially when he found out we had to be at the airport at 5 a.m., but I insisted. By far, the most meaningful part of that day was on the flight home, watching him as he read letters from his entire, from his entire family, honoring his service. Rarely was that man speechless. He was dead. Dad had professional success as an attorney, and by the time I came around, we lived a nice life in a Brooklyn co-op. Many of my memory of, memories of him in those days revolve around the bicycle path near our apartment, top-down rides in his sports cars. In 1969, with us three kids in tow, he left his New York law practice for a much lower-paying civil service job upstate in Utica, New York. Asked about it many years later, he called it the best choice he could made. He worked for the state of New York for the rest of his career, taking what was supposed to be an early retirement package at the tender age of 71. Six months after he retired, I asked him if he was keeping busy, and his response was, busy? I don't know how the hell I ever found time to work. His retirement included shopping, cooking, and traveling. He spent a lot of time with Doris, his companion of over 40 years. And regularly drove down to Norwich. Have Shabbat dinner with his sister. My beloved Henry. And his brother in law. And his oldest friend, nice my Uncle Bob. He drove, of course, unless the weather was good, in which case he rode his motorcycle. <laughs> uh, he also enjoyed visiting with that handful of friends he hadn't already outlived Howie, Ronnie, Jack, Bicycle Bill. Back at home, he and Mom had divorced in 1975. I was in junior high when Mom moved out and my sisters left for college all within a week or so. Dad and I had a fair amount of conflict from then on, <laughs> which we both survived. I can judge my parents' ultimate success by their nine grandchildren here today, all of whom are healthy, functioning, adults, and more importantly, good and kind people. I mentioned bicycles earlier, and I'll add that when the very first belt bicycle helmets came out in the uh, late 1970s, he bought one for me and one for himself. They were the first bicycle helmets I, or frankly anyone, had ever seen. In later years, he also insisted on buying helmets for the, everyone in the family with the line, you will not deprive me of the pleasure of buying helmets for my grandchildren. <laughs> Those who knew Dad and I when I was a teen may have been a bit surprised when I took Dad into my home in early 2019. But Dad's definition of family was this. Family are the people who, if you have to go there, they have to take you in. <laughs> so when he could no longer manage by himself in New Hartford, we brought him to Cleveland. I had matured somewhat, and he had mellowed somewhat. I also promised him regular visits to Syracuse, which continued up until the pandemic hit shortly before Doris's passing. 
to almost everyone's surprise, these past few years were actually wonderful for my relationship with my father. Most, but not all, of the things that, made, that were difficult about him had faded away over the course of his 90s. And what we were left with was a surprisingly charming old man who constantly marveled at his wonderful luck in life, particularly when he came, when he came to his family. And that's how I choose to remember him. teaches that words come from the heart, enter directly into the heart, and indeed they have. I just want to take a moment to share a personal reflection. I do so at the expense of some of the traditional liturgy in the funeral service. And I made that decision out of respect for Sidney because I studied enough Torah with him after he came out here to discover that he didn't really have all that much interest in traditional liturgy. <laughs> <laughs> he was willing to tolerate my interest in it, but at no point in time did he join me in that. <laughs> and pre-COVID, we've continued it online during COVID, COVID, we used to meet a group of us every Thursday morning at a local deli in the back room and we had something and we still do it, we just don't do it in person, called Toast and Torah when we would study generally the weekly Torah portion, though occasionally we deviate and do something else. And we had a nice group of people, small but dedicated, and some years ago we finally convinced my in-laws to move out here really for the same reasons that Sydney ultimately moved out here. This was just a little bit before Sid came out and they moved out here and they came to Toast and Tobra and that brought the average age up of the group considerably. And then it was probably within about a year of that that Sydney came out and Naomi, I think maybe bribed him with breakfast. I'm not sure what it was. It certainly wasn't studying with me. David, David. <laughs> And we got sit out of the house uh, sat, uh, Thursday mornings, and he came, and that brought the average age even more <laughs> up, and and that was quite an experience to try and lead a discussion group with the usual, the regulars. That we had gotten into a nice rhythm. <laughs> then my in-laws came and disrupted it with their wacky, who knows where they were coming from, <laughs> world, and then Sydney joined with his great story. <laughs> And uh, I don't know what to say. Then COVID came. I don't know if it was in response to what was going on or not. And I'll say this about studying Torah with Sid. He was a man of tremendous gifted intellect. And forget about what he thought about the religiosity of the text. But his insight into the text and the things that we were studying that came out of the text were always worth listening to and pondering and thinking about. He and all of you were blessed with his long life. And people who live extremely long like that develop a kind of aura about them, a little like the Energizer Bunny. They just keep going. Whatever happens in life, they're there. They're a constant in our lives. And while we appreciate and celebrate his long life that was so well lived, this is also a time of grief and sadness. And we don't feel that any less just because Sid lived to be 98. In some ways, I think we feel it even more intensely because he was with us for so long. You've had him for so much of your lives. 
And these are days of grief and of weeping and of wailing. Our tradition refers to the first few days as Yemei Bechi, the days of wailing. And we're to let it out and to grieve and to grieve deeply and to feel it. The 90th Psalm tells us this. The days of our years are three score and ten, or perhaps by reason of strength, four score years. But a thousand years in God's sight are but as yesterday when it is past. And here's the essential message of this psalm. And it reflects the way Sid lived. Teach us therefore to number our days that we may attain a heart of wisdom. May your favor, O God, be upon us. Establish the work of our hands that it may long endure. And the way he lived and the way he loved and the things he did, the contributions he made, to your family, to his community, to all of your lives. They survive him and they live on in all of you. You carry him with you in your heart and in your soul. We know that we take nothing material with us from this world when we die. What lives, <laughs> what lives on that has significance is that in the way some people live their lives, they acquire for themselves the Keter Shem Tov, the crown of a good name. Sid earned the crown of his good name over and over and over again. And that's what's bequeathed to all of you. And every time you honor his life, and every time you remember him, you carry the crown of his good name into the future. And you pay tribute to a life well and richly lived. We rob death of ultimate victory by living life as long as it is ours to live. To ask of death that it never come is futile. But it is not futility to pray that when death does come for us, it may, take, it may take us from a world, one corner of which is a little better, because we were there. When we die and people grieve for us, let it be because we touch their lives with beauty and simplicity. Let it not be said that life was good to us, but rather that we were good to life. If you are able to easily do so, please rise at this time. El male rachami shochein bamromi. Am se menucha nechona tachat kanfei hashchina im kedoshi mutahorim kizohar harakia mazirim et nishmad yaakov shlomo shehalach leolamo. Began aid and the Hamanukato Anabal Harachamim As the Rehu beset her canafecha Le Olamim By its roar, Bitro Hachaim and Nishmata Adonai Hunakalata The Yanuach be Shalom al Mishkava Vinoma. Amen. Passionate God, eternal spirit of the universe, grant perfect rest in your sheltering presence to Sidney J. Schiffman, for he has now entered eternity. O God of mercy, we pray 
May Sidney find refuge in your eternal presence, and may his soul be bound up in the bond of everlasting life. God is his inheritance, and we all say, Amen. Amen. God is sure, our removable rock, all God's work is upright. The eternal governs what is above and what is below, overseeing both the valleys of death and the heights of life. God is sure, our removable rock, you are righteous in your dealings in both death and life, and every soul is in your trust. O oh God, help us to understand that grief and love go hand in hand. That the pain which loss inflicts is the measure of love stronger than death. Though we may cry in the anguish of our hearts, may we also be like children who know that their parent is near and who cling unafraid to that trusted hand. O oh God, we commit all that is precious to us to your keeping. to read a poem in English translated from the Hebrew written by Hannah Senesh, who was a great hero of the Second World War period. She was a Hungarian Jew who fought with the partisans and who died behind enemy lines after parachuting in to help those in need. There are stars up above, so far away, we only see their light long, long after the star itself is gone. There are people whose memory burns bright and lights the world, even after they themselves are no longer among us. It is these lights that shine even in the darkest night. It is these lights that guide us and illumine for us our path. We pay tribute to Sydney's memory as we join together in the words of the mourner's cottage. Yitkadal v'yitkadash shemei rabah v'yalmad v'yirach d'ruzei v'yamlich machutei v'chayi chon v'yomei chon v'chayi v'chayi Yisrael v'agala v'yizman kari v'yimru amein yehei shemei rabah v'yirach v'yolam v'yomei amayim yitbarach v'yishtabach v'yitbahar v'yitromam v'yitmasei we're going to lower the casket into the grave. Once that's done, I'm going to ask Rita and Naomi and David to each place a shovel full of earth into the grave. And then we'll give the cemetery staff a moment to place the vault lid on top of the grave and then family members and everyone else who wishes can continue with placing earth into the grave. We take part in the burial of our dead as an expression and fulfillment of the mitzvah of chesed shel emes, the final kindness that we can perform for one we love.
on her behalf, as it were. <laughs> this family will observe Shiva at Karen and David's home on Deptford, Deptford Drive today and tomorrow, 5 p.m. to 8 p.m., and then on Wednesday from 2 to 5 p.m. Those who may wish to honor Sydney memory with a charitable contribution the family suggests we direct the generosity to service dogs of america the rabbis fund the temple emmanuel in utica new york or planned parenthood of greater ohio
right here. Oh, 